Hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> Looks like people are still trickling in, so let's start with a couple questions, shall we? How many of you here have ever had a full list of important things to do, all the time you need to get them done, but you end up doing something else entirely? Usually something way less important. All right, good, good amount of people here. Second question. How many of you consistently spend more time to get started on things than you do actually getting them done? Great, I am giving this talk to the perfect crowd. Well, as you might be able to guess from my mouthful of a title, I am not here to give you the secrets to perfect focus. Instead, I'm here to share a mental model, one that has helped me manage and better understand my attention span over the past years. Spoilers, it has a little something to do with Windows Task Manager. It makes sense in context. My name is Xia Chen, and I work as a product manager at Microsoft. That means on a day-to-day -day basis, I am managing deployments and new features and angry people on GitHub, not just for myself, but for the 50-something engineers on my team. I also have attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Now, that means in my natural state, I have pretty terrible memory. I have a hard time keeping track of information. And as a result, I struggle to get things done. Now, you might be thinking, hey, Jia Chen, um, I hate to break it to you, but I think you might have chosen a wrong career path for yourself. But the funny thing is, I've been doing this job for a little over four years now, and turns out my ADHD is actually what makes me, is it what actually makes me a good PM. To put it in software terms, having ADHD has helped me avoid a lot of technical debt. So what I mean by that is technical debt being the cost of future work needed when you start off with a quick and easy but ultimately limited solution. Now for human beings, that quick and easy solution tends to be our brains. With my ADHD, that was not an option for me. So just to get to the point of being a functional human being, I had to build up systems. Having a limited amount of resources in terms of attention and memory means I had to get clear about what to focus on real early on. Now, working in tech, it's easy to start a bunch of things and just leave a bunch of half-finished projects in your wake. Now, that's fine if you're an individual contributor, but once you start getting into management or people start depending on you finishing your things to get their stuff done, that stops holding up. But the thing is, people without ADHD also need systems to manage their tasks and knowledge. They need to get really good at prioritizing. But they tend to need them later on. So that means they're doing the equivalent of debugging during production, right? They have kids, and suddenly they're dealing with distraction all the time. They get a promotion, and suddenly they have massive scope. And that's not a great time or place to start a whole new system. That brings me to a potentially controversial statement. Struggling with attention is not a binary, but a spectrum. People have different levels of executive function. Now, what I mean by that is the ability to control where your attention goes. Now, this is really important because it really defines what you pay attention to, what you're able to do, and how you do it. Now, this visualization is a bit reductive. I mean, People's experience with attention is not static. If you have a life crisis, if you're dealing with more distractions than usual, you're probably going to find yourself closer to the left side of the range than you usually are. So you'll see that people with ADHD are going to be towards the left side of the scale. But it's also a spectrum. Someone who's at the very end of this tip is going to have a very different experience than someone who only has a couple symptoms. And if you move just a little bit over to the right, you'll see people who don't have ADHD, but they're going to struggle with attention in similar ways, potentially just not as bad. And that's going to hold true as you move all the way to the right. For that reason, the solutions, 
the knowledge that helps people with ADHD can be helpful for everyone on this range. This is a tech conference, so let's talk a bit about computers. Computers don't manage attention, computers manage processing power. And information about running processes gets surfaced in something like Windows Task Manager. Now in an ideal world, our brains should look something like this, where we have live and accurate information all the time about what's taking up our brain space at any given time, and all the processes are pretty reasonable, right? There's nothing that's taking a ridiculous amount of CPU to go. Unfortunately, that is not how it works. My task manager looks more like this, where the ROM processes are taking up too much processing power. I mean, I probably don't need half of my brain going towards existential anxiety and the pile of laundry that has been building up on my floor. I can run new tasks, but you can see that I can't close off any old ones. And the numbers I'm getting are just wrong. I think I'm working with 72% of free CPU when I have more like 20%. And that means I'm going to be making some bad decisions in terms of priority. To debug our mental task managers, we have to diagnose the issues. So let's try that out together, shall we? <laughs> How many of you have procrastinated before? Kind of what I expected. <laughs> Well, the key reason people will give for why they procrastinate is that they simply have too much to deal with and they just don't have enough processing power. They say it's a technical limitation. Now, the obvious solution to that is to get more processing power. Now, unfortunately, it is harder to get a new brain than it is to upgrade to a better laptop with better specs. But for many people with ADHD, myself included, they find that medication helps them unlock processing power that was already there, just behind a biochemical barrier. The most effective approach, luckily, is also the one that works for everyone. And that is to better manage the processing power we do have. You have probably all heard advice like, don't work on everything at once, don't multitask, just forget about the unimportant things and prioritize. But if you're anything like me, that's way easier said than done. That is because humans, unlike computers, depend on a biochemical named dopamine to deallocate memory and close out processes when they finish something. And it does that by making us feel accomplished. But if your neurochemistry is different, maybe you have ADHD, maybe you have depression, maybe that's just how your individual physiology works, that's not so easy. Also, in our modern world, let's be honest, it gives us way less dopamine to send an email or write documentation than it does to do something concrete, like hunt down a wild boar or even submit a PR for a bug fix. When there's not enough dopamine, getting things done no longer makes us feel accomplished. It just makes us feel relieved especially when it's something you've been procrastinating on for weeks and months. You feel guilty, you feel ashamed, and when you get things done at that point, doesn't make you feel good anymore, just makes you feel relieved. And that is not enough to close out this loop and get you more dopamine so you can do your next thing. The solution here is not to just try harder. The dopamine feature just isn't there or it's not functioning correctly. The goal here should be to figure out what you need as an individual to close out a mental process. Sometimes your solution is already out there in some external library. Sometimes you have to invest in the time to build it for yourself. What I do is a combination of the two. I trick myself into making the task concrete even when it really isn't. And I do that by externalizing it as much as I can through systems like bullet journals and habit trackers. I will serialize the processes and store it externally in a format that is easier for me to work with. So for example, I'll use the Zettelkasten method, which connects nodes of knowledge in a much more intuitive way than the standard. 
I have trained myself to the point that instead of only getting dopamine when I finish something, whatever that means, I can get dopamine whenever I make progress towards my goal. So this can be serialization, it can be deserialization, it might even be giving up. As long as I turn failure into a way of ending the process, I can still get dopamine out of it. Now the second bug that makes procrastination happen is in the front end. Sometimes my user interface just is not showing me the correct information or certain buttons and functionalities are just grayed out. Here's a concrete example. Let's say my working memory can only hold three background processes at a time and the rest is invisible. Now I'll use the dopamine technique I just talked about to close out those processes by serializing them, by which I mean I store them somewhere outside of my working memory in a form that makes them easier to work with when I do have capacity. Then I'll wait for the next three to populate, and then again and again until everything is externalized. And when everything's saved, I can start prioritizing and start working my way through. Now the takeaway is this. You need to customize, you need to iterate, and you need to experiment to find a solution that works for you. You don't want to force a square peg into a round hole just because some best-selling author said, hey, this is the only way you can get things done. Now, if you know, you know. The biggest issue I run into with procrastination, however, is not being able to start the process. Maybe every time I think about it, it's overwhelming. I just work on something easier instead. Or I sit down to do the thing, and it turns out I have a dependency that I needed to work out beforehand. While I have limited processing power, so I just end up not doing either. When things feel too overwhelming, it's likely that the process requires too much CPU to run as it is. Now, there are two reasons for that to happen. The first one is the more logical one, which is it's just a really big process. It's too complex. In that case, we want to break it down. We can do that by functionality. So think about going from a monolith to a modular, modular monolith or to a distributed architecture. But if you're not sure what that architecture looks like, you can also divide it up by the time you're spending. So what I'll do is the Pomodoro technique, because if I'm working in 25 minute long sprints with five minute breaks, every time I get a little dopamine hit because I've completed a thing. And it really lets me do the same amount of processing at the end of the day, but I'm distributing the demand so I'm not DDoSing myself, you know? The second reason is a bit more illogical, because unlike, hum uh, unlike computers, sometimes for a human, a process takes a lot to run, even if it's small. If there is a negative emotion involved with that process, like shame or embarrassment, even something like picking up a sock off the floor can become paralyzing. Now, this is a bit more complicated to solve. How can you stop feeling bad about something? How do you take away the shame and the guilt and just do the thing? Now, serialization has an additional benefit here because transforming that process to another format can help you either eliminate the negative emotions or you can take that negative emotion and turn it into a separate process that you can work through first and then you can work on the thing you actually need to. The final possibility is you have a dependency issue classic, right? And because you didn't take care of the dependencies first, when you start up the process, it just crashes. That's frustrating. You have no motivation to keep going. And what I will do is I, redefi I redefine the process. So success means crashing as soon as possible so I can get the logs and debug. I get enough dopamine from finishing that off so I can allocate additional processing power to finish the task I actually need. In conclusion, struggling to focus is a result in, of bugs in how our brain manages attention. The good news is there are many ways to debug. The bad news is there are many ways to debug. The first step to solving any problem is understanding it in a way that makes sense to you. 
a lot of our knowledge about managing limited processing power and memory for computers can be applied to something that's arguably more important, which is managing our own limited processing power and memory. Obviously, I am not saying that our brains are Windows Task Manager. Human brains are never going to map perfectly to computers. But I think there is a lot we can learn by applying the mental model from the former to the latter. Now, I want to end off with a challenge to you all. Sometime in the next 24 hours, I want you to take a common attention management technique, something you heard here, something you just know from general culture, and define it using the mental model of computers and processing power. For example, a common piece of advice is don't multitask. Well, the computer version of that is context switching between different threads. And there is a cost in terms of saving the existing CPU state, loading up the new one, and once you're done, loading up the old one. But just like in real life, sometimes you have to do it. So how do we make that better? How do we make it cheaper to do, and how do we find the hidden benefits to multitasking? For example, you can switch between two related processes, so you're minimizing the amount that you have to flush out and load back in. A hidden benefit as a result is you can really shorten the dopamine loop by rewarding yourself with context switching. So if you're switching between two related things, you feel like you're done way faster than if you focus on one thing and just have to do it all the way through. As you can tell, using the mental model for processing power and computers on yourself can help you get a better sense of how to make things work for you specifically. You can turn that square peg into a round peg with specificity. So thank you all for watching. I um, hope you got something out of this talk. I know it's not exactly a conventional tech conference talk. And because this is my first talk, I would love if you could scan that QR code, leave me a bit of feedback. Loving the multicolored cards, but doesn't really tell me anything about how to improve. Thanks, everyone.